A wise man once said you can't polish a turd, but we can make it look presentable. For the sake of science, I drew Sasuke with horrible anatomy to see how far we can take polishing this big fat steamer. This video is brought to you by the bad Sasuke meme. In this episode, I'm going to go over 10 ways to do the final touches of your digital painting. Sometimes you're just burnt out over a painting and you don't want to focus on the structure anymore and you just want to finish it up and this video is how to make something with a bad structure look at least a little bit presentable. I still use a lot of these methods for my actual paintings and they're good to know. Tip number one, flip and liquefy. After a while, your eyes get tired of looking at a painting and some mistakes don't become really obvious anymore. So sometimes you need a new perspective and there's a couple ways you can do it. So you can turn your canvas upside down and that will point out some apparent mistakes. You can also flip the image and then everything becomes way more apparent. Sometimes in the end stages of painting, you might have merged all your layers together and that's where the liquify tool comes in handy because you can kind of just push a little bit of your anatomy to the correct position. Position. It might be a little bit wonky, but at least you can fix it a little bit and then do a paint over. At least in this stage of the painting, I also like to check my values, so I'll turn everything black and white. I also check how everything contrasts. Another thing that I do if I'm struggling is I'll pull in another artist's like work and then I'll turn their values to black and white and compare it with mine. And that way I can have a little bit of a roadmap as far as like the value structure. Tip number two, add some rim lights and specular highlights. So sometimes your painting doesn't have enough contrast and this is where rim lights come into play and they can be pretty helpful. What you want to do is you want to go on the shadow side and then take something bright in value and kind of just mark the form on one side of your subject. So my values were kind of weak in this painting so I looked at Cynic's face portraits and I colored picked the rim light on one of his faces and then kind of use that same value for mine. On Sasuke's face, I could have darkened up his like main face so the rim light looked better, but I'm just gonna take this as a rough reference. Try your best not to just outline one side of the character because that's gonna make it look flat. What I like to do to help combat this is like I try to wrap it around and for me and my shape language I like to use a lot of different triangles and that kind of helps it not look like an outline. So if you find corners just like do triangles and that kind of helps with the shape language. When you're painting you're designing shapes and at least for me I would rather have cool shapes than try to follow reality. As far as blend modes I just like to use normal and like an opaque brush so it brushes over everything but hard light, soft light, those things work. It's up to your preference. Tip number three, have your background enhance your focal point. So you don't need a detailed background to have a good painting. And if you look at a lot of portraits, they do that thing where the face is super detailed and you look at the background and it's just blurry, but it looks good. And that's because it adds focus and it also provides depth to that piece. The focus point for this painting will be Sasuke's weird eye. And there's a couple things I can do. First thing is make a vignette. And I just take a black airbrush and I make the outer edges of the painting a little bit darker. So your eyes kind of lead towards the light center part of Sasuke and a lot of portraits do this it's very easy for it to look corny so I would say just have your vignette be subtle most of the time another thing you can do is add a bright backlight behind your subject and this will act as a framing device it'll also provide a lot of contrast so I like to make a bright blue light usually behind the character's head and that usually helps my composition a little bit this also helps the rim light make a little bit more sense. And then if you look at that bright light, I'm also doing a little bit of leading lines moving towards the center of his eye. And those background line brushes are just gonna have these like invisible lines that look into Sasuke's eyes and then Sasuke's eye is looking towards you. And that helps with composition. Speaking of composition, I'm using the 30-70 rule. So if you look at Sasuke, he's taking about 70% of the painting. And then the negative space, the background, that's the last 30%. And this is a suggestion, but it usually has a balanced look to it. I'm gonna add one more compositional element and this will help provide depth and framing. And I'm gonna draw some chains that's kind of wrapping around his face. And this is gonna help frame his eye. And if you look at my backgrounds, notice how I'm not really putting too much details. They're just mainly one color and 
the chains itself are just silhouettes. And then I'm gonna add a Gaussian blur. That way it provides a, like a depth of field because our focus is Sasuke, not the chains. And that's why I'm just using a single black and I'm blurring it because you want your eyes to focus on how detailed that chain is, unless that's part of your painting. When it comes to composition, the general rule I like to stick to is you have a focal point, you have things framing that focal point, and you have things pointing to that focal point, and that's going to keep you safe 90% of the time. And there are exceptions, but this is kind of my go-to default. It's also important to think about the level of detail, so that focal point is where you're going to have the most details, and then as you get farther away, the level of details is going to go down, and this is going to save your sanity, but it also looks more appealing most of the time. Tip number four pushing your form with the lasso and airbrush when you're painting sometimes you know you add textures you're adding more contrast you're taking away contrast and you start to lose your form and it gets a little bit muddy sometimes on a new layer I like to take a lasso tool and then with an airbrush just do like a light edge and make it super soft but this helps not only regain some of my edges it also helps push with like an accent light and it adds a little bit of variety to my painting and if you look at realism shading, it's a mix of soft shading and cell shading. And this is what the lasso tool and airbrush kind of does, is it gives you this hard edge and it also feathers it out. And then you can kind of mix it with like more shell shading, but giving that like that variety between the two kind of helps my paintings out a lot. As far as blend modes go, sometimes I use the soft light, sometimes I use hard light. If I'm doing, if I'm pushing shadows, I'll use the multiply, but sometimes I just use the normal brush and put the opacity down, and that helps just as good. You just kind of have to play around with it. Tip number five, add some dust and particles. So this is my favorite part of painting because it's so simple, it's so easy, but it adds so much to it. I always add dust to all my paintings because it adds atmosphere and it makes everything look alive. I'm using Mark Burnett's brush pack because he has a dust brush and it helps a lot. You can also make your own. There's a bunch of free versions online too and it doesn't really matter. It's just essentially white circles. But pretty much what you do is you fill out your canvas completely with a bunch of white circles and then you go with a soft erase brush and you erase some of it, you push some of it more in the backgrounds and then I take a lasso tool and different clusters of them, I'll do a Gaussian blur and that helps give it make it not look like just a dust overlay, it kind of gives it a little bit of depth and that's what I do to a lot of my dust effects. The cool thing about dust particles is you can add movement and flow to a very static painting and pretty much I like to do like a diagonal swoosh and sometimes I take a liner brush and just like draw little lines and then I erase it out but it helps give almost like movement to a very static painting. Also another thing I like to add for this section is half tones and then the comb brush and then the comb brush kind of does the same thing. The nice thing about the comb brush is you kind of you can follow form with it and it kind of adds a texture to a very solid color. So just co play with the comb brush and then the halftone brush. You can find these free online. Um, Sam does art. He he uses the comb brush a lot and it helps provide textures. But if you take a color and just make half tones and then just kind of erase it back, it helps obscure details where you don't want to focus details on and it gives a cool like graphical look to it. I would just say look into those two, they help break up your blocks of color and add soft edges in an interesting way. Tip number six, add a color filter. Sometimes you lose control of colors and that's okay. To fix this, just take a paint bucket on the top layer and just fill everything with a single color and then change the blend mode to color. You can also do hue and saturation and play around with those, but color is my go-to. After that, you can either make a masking layer or just use a soft erase or just erase. But near the focal point is where I'm going to start erasing. That way I get my color variation back. And then on the edges, because I don't want as much color variation, I'll leave a little bit of that like color filter behind. And this adds the same effect as a vignette, but sometimes I like to erase a little area so there's a little bit of texture with that color range. 
but this is a good way to bring your colors back and then you can just play around with the opacity. Sometimes you nail the colors on the original and you completely erase that your layer and that's totally fine. This just gives you another perspective of your painting and it also serves as a value check. Tip number seven, adding bloom. Bloom is essentially overblowing your highlights and for some reason it has a cool dreamy aesthetic and I like to add it to like my bright paintings. But essentially what you do is you go to select color range, select the brightest part of your painting and then on a new layer you paint it with white, turn the blend mode to hard light, soft light or vivid light, it's up to you, even normal and just lower down that opacity and then pretty much you're just condensing all that white information. It helps brighten up your image and gives it more of a blown out look to it. Some things you can do on your bloom layer is play around with the Gaussian blur and then also play around with color and that adds different effects. Tip number eight, artifacting. So this is more for like a pop art graffiti aesthetic, but it helps add interest and hide my mistakes. One thing I like to do is use my color picker tool and block out blocks of color on my shape. And this helps simplify my painting again. And it kind of gives it a little bit more interest, even though you're getting rid of detail. It almost provides contrast compared to like a super rendered area. And then you just have this block of color. And for me, I find that super interesting. Another thing I do is make X's, make circles, go back to very primitive shapes, and for some reason, they just make everything have this cool style to it. I like to make weird symbols and bright colors on the edges, and it almost serves as a framing device again. At this point, it's very experimental, and I'd say just kind of go crazy because you can always delete back your if you go too hard with it you can always delete back but some things I like to do is I like to do a smear I like to add X's and then sometimes drips too so like if you notice these hands they're freaking ugly so what I did is I added drips and I kind of obscured some of that hand details so that they're not as noticeable and even if you want to look at it now they're being blocked off and unless you looked at my time-lapse photo, you don't even know that I drew them so god-awful. Tip number nine, add a noise filter. On a new layer, use a paint bucket and fill it with color, and then go to filter, add noise. And this doesn't really matter, usually I just do uniform monochromatic and that helps. But once you add noise, go and change the blend mode to multiply. Now you have this nice grain filter, but sometimes it's too much, so you can lower down the opacity, and then you can play around with the curves and that helps. But I like to take the erase brush and just kind of erase it around the focal point, but the noise helps kind of lead your eyes to the focal point, but it also provides a little bit of a texture to everything and it kind of uniforms everything, but I like to go subtle with the noise. I feel like it helps my paintings. Tip number 10, chromatic aberration. Other apps like Procreate makes this way easier, and Photoshop it's a little wonky, but this is how you do it. So you're gonna duplicate everything and merge it to a single layer, that way you're not erasing all your work. And then you're gonna duplicate it three times, and you're gonna double click on it, and you're gonna edit the color channel. And depending if you're CMYK or RBG, it's gonna be different. For me, I'm using RBG, and then I'm just unchecking each layer. So one layer is red, one layer is green, one layer blue and together they make up the single image and pretty much if you just select one of those layers and slightly askew it to like two pixels to the left you got chromatic aberration um another way you can do it is go to the filter and liquify tool and you can kind of liquefy which areas you want more chromatic aberration and this is good for like magic stuff for this painting i'm just taking the regular rectangular select tool and I'm just grabbing areas near the outside of the focal point and just moving it to the right and adding that little bit of variation. And I feel like this adds a lot of interest and I add it to a lot of my paintings. You wanna be subtle with chromatic aberration, but if you look at a lot of cameras, they have chromatic aberration very subtly. So it helps add realism by distorting your crispiness of your painting. And the thing about digital painting is it's so easy for it to look sterile. You kind of have to remake it grunge for it to look appealing again. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's vector art that's just single colors and they look clean and more power to them. But at least for me, digital painting, the more rougher in texture I add to it, the more 
better it looks, at least for my style. Another positive of making things look rough and grungy is you can hide your weak points of your art. And in this whole tutorial, that's what we're doing. We're hiding the weakness of our art and now it looks presentable-ish. Just remember, these are 10 ways to polish up your paintings. They're not here to help your fundamental mistakes. And at the end of the day, without the fundamentals, you're just going to make a polished turd. But that's okay. I can help you out with this video over here.